The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... The great commandment is to love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. You notice that great commandment includes everybody. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. You remember a little bit of rehearsal that the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, had a wild feast. And in the party, he began to mock the God of heaven, and he used these holy vessels to praise the gods of silver and gold and wood and stone and clay. And as a result of that, this handwriting appeared on the wall, and it pronounced the judgment on Babylon. They didn't know what the handwriting meant, so they brought in Daniel. And Daniel then interpreted it. Meeny, meeny, tickle you farson. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting, and your kingdom is now divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Matter of fact, that very night, the Medes and the Persians were diverting the Euphrates River where it went under the walls of Babylon, and the kingdom of Babylon fell. All of the, co the government officials and the cabinet that had served Belshazzar were executed with one exception. That old patriarch and prophet named Daniel he was spared because he had an excellent spirit in him. A matter of fact, he became one of the prime advisors for King Darius of the, the Median king. And Darius was so impressed with the wisdom and the commitment and the honesty of Daniel, he was thinking about putting Daniel in charge of the whole empire of Medo-Persian, prime minister. Well, when the other Medo-Persian government officials heard that, they were outraged that they would take this captive from Judah and that they would be replaced. They went before the king, and they sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Had private detectives following him around, trying to find something that he was doing wrong. But they found he was faithful in every area of his life. Finally, they persuaded the king to make a law. And this, the idea was, you make this religious, political law, and it will weld the kingdom together. together. That's why Nebuchadnezzar made the golden statue to try and Creates solidarity, um, solidarity among all these different nations. Make a law that nobody should pray to anybody but you for the next 30 days. And the king thought, well, yeah, well, that makes the kingdom stronger, and it appealed to his ego, so he signed it into law. And the Bible tells us the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. It says it four times. It cannot be changed. And they knew that. Now, this scripture really stirs me with emotion. It tells us in Daniel chapter 6, verse 15, or verse 10, I'm sorry. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew about the death decree. He went into his house, his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he had always done. Daniel could have used that scripture where Jesus said, enter into your closet and shut the door. But he was not going to hide his relationship with God. He flung his windows open. Amen. He prayed toward Jerusalem. He got on his knees where he was in a physical posture of prayer, and he prayed out loud. Amen. He put the law of God ahead of the law of man. The law of God said, thou shalt not have other gods, and that even means the king of Persia, even if it means you're going to lose your job, even if it means you're going to lose your life. Did God honor Dan Daniel for his faithfulness? Sure enough. Well, you know, the spies were watching, and pretty soon they ran to the king. And they said, King, you know you made that law, and the law does not change, that if anybody prays to any god or man for 30 days except you, he's going to the lion's den. And that was a death decree back in those days. These were ferocious Asian lions. And the king said, that's right, that's the law. And they said, that Daniel from the captivity of Judah, he broke your law, and the king was outraged. He did everything he could to try and find some legal loophole to save Daniel, but there was nothing he could do. And so finally, regrettably, he had to go ahead and fulfill the law. The king could not change the law. And the king gave the command, 
And they brought Daniel and they cast him into the den of lions. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God who you serve from time to time, occasionally, when it's convenient, your God who you serve continually, he will deliver you. He might deliver you. Friends, you know, that's a wonderful promise. If you serve God continually, he will deliver you. And there is a similar test coming to the people of this planet. That's why we need to learn. So a stone was placed on the mouth of the lion's den, just as a stone was placed on Christ's tomb. And it was sealed with a government seal, just as there was a government seal placed on the tomb of Jesus. And the king then went and he spent the night in fasting back at his palace. First thing in the morning, he came to the lion's den and he pulled the cover off and he called to Daniel and he said, Daniel, has your God who you serve been able to deliver you? They'd never heard anybody talking out of the lion's den before. Nobody had ever come out of the lion's den before. And a voice came up and the king's mouth dropped open and he said, King, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth and they have not hurt me because I was innocent before you and before God. And Daniel was brought out of the lion's den. Now some people think, well, this was no miracle. Well, the lions just weren't hungry. You know, they had just eaten scores of Babylonian politicians and they were probably laying with swollen bellies at the bottom of the den burping and they couldn't eat and they groaned and rolled over when Daniel was thrown in there. This was no miracle. You know, a lot of people get into trouble because they don't keep on reading in the Bible. Reminds me about a story where a young man went to a mission here in New York City and after he accepted the Lord, his life was changed. They gave him a Bible. He went and sat in park bench there in Central Park and started reading the Bible and he couldn't contain himself. He was so excited. He had never known these things before. Pretty soon he said, thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He'd heard him say that back at the mission. He wanted to express his gratitude to God. Well, there was an atheist walking by and he heard the young man with all this religious expression. He said, well, why are you shouting like this? Oh, and the young Christian man said, sir, this is wonderful. I'm reading in the Bible where the Lord parted the Red Sea and the children of Israel went over on dry ground. And this distinguished looking atheist said, a young man, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but it was the sea of reeds and it was only six inches deep. Well, he looked so distinguished and intelligent, the young convert didn't want to contradict him and he said, thank you, I didn't realize that, appreciate that. Just as the atheist got a little ways away, he heard the young man shouting, praise the Lord, hallelujah, this is wonderful. And he came back over, he said, now why are you shouting? He said, Mr. Lord just drowned the whole Egyptian army in six inches of water. <laughs> Now, if you don't think the lions were hungry, the Bible says, then they took the men who had accused Daniel and they threw them in the lion's den and the lions had the mastery of them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever hit the bottom. This was a miracle. You don't think the fiery furnace was hot? It was hot enough to kill those who threw in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? God always backs up his miracles one way or another. Now, amazing facts went out on the streets in Manhattan. We wanted to get a feel from the people here in this big city to find out how do they react to the law of God. Do they think the Ten Commandments are still relevant today? I want you to take a look at some of the responses that we received. I believe the Ten Commandments are relevant because today we have to have some kind of moral background or moral fiber to keep us all in focus and harmony together. I am a Christian and I do think the Ten Commandments are relevant today. As for religion per se, my belief is if the person is good, they don't need religion. Yes, I believe they are relevant today because um, it's just everyday living, you know, things that people should know in school, especially young kids. Yes, I do think they're relevant. Not really because I don't think anybody follows the Ten Commandments. I don't even think half the people know what they are. Yes, I believe that uh, team commitments are important because um, it's still um, has uh, good values, and I think um, students need to learn good stuff. I believe that the Ten Commandments are important today because Jesus, when he came preaching the kingdom of God, he said that the most important commandment was for us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and that is of the Ten Commandments 1 through 4. And then he also said that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. We should definitely still keep the Ten Commandments because God's word still exists. His word is still alive and it still is, exists today and as yesterday, even as today. I believe that the Ten Commandments are important 
to each person in their own way. But I, I do believe that it's been loosely <laughs> translated now, and um, it basically depends on what kind of a person you want to be. Interesting spectrum of answers that people have there about how we're supposed to relate to the law of God. You know what I wanted to do? Those who said, yes, I think we should keep them, I was going to say, could you please name them for me? <laughs> now it's time for us to get into our study of the law of God. Number 10. Upon what law is the new covenant based? Hebrews 8.8. 8. No, 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 no. Hebrews 8.10. For this is the covenant that I will make, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them in their hearts. You know, when we sin, it hurts us. When we sin, it hurts others and it hurts God. The great commandment is to love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. You notice that great commandment includes everybody. Love the Lord and love your neighbor as you love yourself. I heard someone say that the true meaning of happiness is spelled J-O-Y. Jesus, others, and then you. The world has turned that equation upside down where they say, you take care of yourself first, and then take care of others, you know, humanitarian, and then if there's time left, we'll think about God. But no, God says, I come first. Love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then you love your neighbor, and then when you give, you'll be happy. We, we have everything inverted backwards. Number 11. Does living under grace by faith make keeping God's law non-essential? Romans 6.15. What then? Shall we sin, break God's law, because we're not under the law but under grace? What does Paul say? God forbid. Romans 3.31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. When we have faith, we establish the law. We don't nullify or negate or make void the law by faith. Paul says in Romans chapter uh, 3 verse, or what is it? Romans chapter 2 verse 13. It is not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. God wants us to obey. The Bible says we've got so many people that say, Lord, Lord, and they do not the will of their Father in heaven. What is the will of God? No, wait. Let me back up. First, I want to string you along. How many of you agree with me that God wants us to do His will? That it's, it's critical to our relationship with the Lord. What is the will of God? Psalms 40 verse 8, Yea, I love to do thy will, thy law is within my heart. When you've got the law of God in your heart, you'll want to do the will of God. That's the way it needs to work. And the more time you spend looking at God, you'll develop a love relationship with Him. Now, I want to talk about not being, well, 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 can't make up my mind. I'm running out of time and I've got a thousand things left to say. I've been to traffic school several times. I don't know how many times, but I could teach the course. <laughs> I haven't been lately. My insurance is actually clean now because I think I've learned my lesson. You've got to look at all your mirrors. <laughs> but uh, more than once I've been pulled over. And you know that sinking feeling. You know, one time, I don't know what I was thinking. I was driving down the road. I had just come off a highway where the speed limit was like 65 or 70. And I was in that mode. And then I went on another highway where it was 55. And I wasn't even paying attention. And I passed a highway patrolman. He wasn't parked on the side. I drove past him. I'm a deep thinker. And I don't know what I was thinking about that day. He then pulled me over. And he said, well, you weren't going that fast, but I felt kind of silly because I was following someone and you passed me. I said, oh, officer, please have mercy. My insurance rates are going to go up. My wife will never let me forget about this. Can you have mercy on me? He said, I tell you what, I'm going to let you go. Now, I didn't want to pull over when the lights started, those blue and red lights in my rear view mirror. I didn't want to pull over, but you know what? I'd broken the law. The law said 55. I was going 65. And when I broke the law, I was under the curse, the authority of the law. I had places to go, but I had to pull over. When I said, have mercy on me, and I've actually said this several times. You know, sometimes what you do is you need to cry. <laughs> I've tried it one time, and she did not give me a ticket. <laughs> so I figure girls can do it, you know. So I said, will you please have mercy on me? He said, okay, well, look, we'll let you go. And... Um, I said, I know I'm guilty. Have mercy on me. I just, I'm honest with him. 
And he said, we'll let you go. Matter of fact, he said, I'll pay your ticket. <laughs> I didn't really say that. But he said, I'll let you go. So now that he said you're forgiven, I'm not under the law. As soon as he says you're forgiven and you're free to go, I'm now under what? When you're under grace, you know what that means. You understand the true meaning of that. That means then, as you get back in your car, you rev your engine, and you put it in second gear, and you pop your clutch, and you peel away doing donuts and leaving a black streak up the highway, and you can now go 85 miles an hour because I'm not under the law. I'm under grace now. Is that what that means? Oh, no. You know what I did because I was under grace? I turned on my turn signal. I looked both ways. I got out and kicked all the tires. I put it in first gear, I slowly let out the clutch, I waited until there was no one for a half mile in any direction on the road, and I creeped out and I went 52 and a half miles an hour because I was under grace, I was more careful than anybody to obey because I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. You got the idea? When Paul says we're not under the law, he says because of Jesus we're not under the penalty of the law, therefore we are more careful than anybody to show our love and appreciation and do God's will. Other people turn that around like not under the law is a license to crucify Jesus again and again every day. That's a doctrine of devils, friends. That's not what the Bible is teaching. If we are going to understand these final issues, we need to understand the relationship about the law. Question number 12. Are people saved by keeping the law? No. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift he gives us. We all have broken God's law, but he wants to now not only give us forgiveness for the past, God wants to give you power to be different in the present. Amen? Number 13, what motivates a person to obey God's law? Because I want to go to heaven, and I don't want to go to hell. Now that might be a starting point, but what's the best reason to obey God? Love. love for the Lord has to be the reason. It says in Romans 3.10, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then you can read in 1 John 5.3, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. You know, when we really love the Lord, we want to obey Him. Number 14, can I be a true Christian without keeping His commandments? What does the Bible say? 1 John 2, 3 and 4, Hereby do we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments is a a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, some people say, oh, Doug, you're making too much emphasis on the letter of the law. The important thing is the spirit of the law. You know, we've got these people who think the spirit is, is license for disobedience. When Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her in his heart, he's committed adultery, he was explaining the spirit of the seventh commandment. The law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said it's not just an action, it's an attitude, Right? The law says, thou shalt not kill. That's the letter of the law. The spirit of the law says, if you're angry with your brother without cause, Jesus said, you're guilty of murder. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Jesus said, let all your communications be yea, yea, or nay, nay. You don't need to be swearing. Now, if a person says, we don't need to keep the letter anymore, we keep the spirit, that's absurd. The letter is the starting point. You build on that with the spirit. A person says, no, I, I, don't, I don't keep the letter anymore. I don't think about adultery, but I rape people. Obviously, if you're keeping the spirit, you're not going to break the letter, right? Oh, no, I, would, I, would, uh, I, I love my brother. I don't think angry thoughts. I do commit murder, but I'm not angry when I do it. If you're breaking the spirit of the law, you're always breaking the letter. And so this idea that we keep the spirit, if you're really keeping the spirit, it always includes the letter of the law. That's a, an important issue many forget. Number 15, are some Old Testament laws no longer binding upon Christians? Yes, Ephesians 2.15, having abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now you realize that back in the very beginning, God had the Ten Commandment law. 
You remember when Cain killed Abel, God said to Cain, sin lieth at your door. Sin is a transgression of the law. It was a sin to murder back there in the Garden of Eden. When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, Joseph said, how can I commit this sin against God? Adultery was a sin, and that was long before the Ten Commandments were written or spoken by God. So the Ten Commandments go all the way back. But certain ceremonial laws were given to Moses that revolved around the sanctuary and its services, and there were some ceremonial Sabbath days and holidays. These things all pointed to Jesus to help us recognize him. Those things were written on paper and were nailed to the cross. You can't nail stone to anything. And it says the handwriting of these things were nailed to the cross, but the Ten Commandments were not nailed to the cross. That was part of the ceremonial law, but the contained in the yearly Sabbaths. But the moral law and the Ten Commandments is eternal. Number 16, whom does the devil especially hate in the last days? Answer, the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, who does the dragon represent? He's angry with the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. The devil in the last days, prophecy tells us, is especially angry with the people who keep God's commandments. Can you see how this ties into prophecy? The devil has an all-out war against the law because it brings people to Jesus. Number 17, what are some of the glorious rewards of keeping God's law? John 15, verse 11, these things I have spoken unto you that your joy might be full and that your joy might, that your joy might be full. Oh, I said that wrong. Let me try this one more time. These things I've spoken unto you that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Proverbs 29, verse 18. He that keepeth the law, miserable is he. Happy is he. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing will offend them. You will have great peace. Now, friends, I want to give you something to think about. Palestine, or Jerusalem, is in what we call the Holy Land. You know why it's called the Holy Land? You go all around the world, and people from Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, they call that the Holy Land. In the middle of the Holy Land, many years ago, was the temple. In the middle of the temple was the Holy of Holies. In the middle of the Holy of Holies in the Holy Land on the Holy Mountain was the Ark of the Covenant, a golden box. What was inside that box? God wrote His will for the human race in stone. Isn't it interesting? Everyone wants to find the lost golden Ark of the Covenant. They're more interested in the golden box. What God was really interested in is the rocks in the box written with the finger of God. That's the thing that matters. God doesn't want us just to be hearers of the word. He wants us to be doers of the word because Jesus died for our disobedience. You know, friends, many people misunderstand how it grieves the Lord and how much it costs the Father for us to be forgiven. I sometimes wish we could be transported back in time and see what Jesus endured that we might be forgiven. During the days of Oliver Cromwell, a young man who was a soldier fell asleep guarding his post. The penalty for that was death. And he was to be executed at curfew with the ringing of the church bell. Well, when the time came for the soldier to be executed, his fiancée that loved him desperately climbed the bell tower. She got inside the bell and held on with her whole body to this mammoth clapper inside the bell. And Cromwell gave the order that they should ring the bell, and they tried to ring it and ring it, and they couldn't even get a muffled thud out of the bell. On investigation, pretty soon, they found this lady was up there all cut and broken and bruised and bleeding. And they asked her what was going on. She said, I'm his fiance. I love him. Please don't ring the bell. Cromwell said, curfew will not ring tonight. And the man was forgiven. You know, we are under a death penalty. And we have no concept how much Jesus has suffered that we might be forgiven. Have you accepted that forgiveness? When you invite him into your heart, then you want to do his will. Don't worry about how you might obey him tomorrow. You can't even comprehend that. You come to him just as you are today, friends, and he will change your life. He'll give you a new heart. I Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer.
we get credit for Christ's perfect life by faith. God gives you the Spirit because you cannot live the Christian life without the Christian Spirit. All that Christ experiences is an example of what God wants you to experience. The power, the joy, the peace, the access to heaven. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. Hi, friends. Amazing Facts is so excited to tell you about our new Prophecy Study Bible. It's filled with everything you could ever want in a Bible. It's got the maps, red letter edition, concordance, and all 27 of the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides are in here to help you in your personal study and to help you study the Word with your friends. If you'd like to know how you can get a copy of this incredible study Bible, call the toll-free number on the screen or go to our website, amazingfacts.org. Friends, we've been talking today about a subject that has been terribly distorted in modern times. It's absolutely crucial that we understand the relationship between law and grace as it's portrayed in God's Word. The Ten Commandments, written by God's own hand, are the very cornerstone of His government. Yet it seems that many, even among believers, would like to see them done away with. To help you understand this important topic, we've chosen a special gift we'd like to send you absolutely free. It's a study guide entitled, Written in Stone and in it we'll share even more important Bible truth regarding the law of God. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 111. If you prefer, you can simply write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 111, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have today for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember the words of Jesus, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Lions Den. And that was a death decree back in those days. These were ferocious Asian lions. And the king said, that's right, that's the law. And they said, that Daniel from the captivity of Judah, he broke your law and the king was outraged. He did everything he could to try and find some legal loophole to save Daniel, but there was nothing he could do. And so finally, regrettably, he had to go ahead and fulfill the law. The king could not change the law. And the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and they cast him into the den of lions. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, your God who you serve from time to time occasionally, when it's convenient, your God who you serve continually, he will deliver you. He might deliver you. Friends, you know, that's a wonderful promise. If you serve God continually, he will deliver you. And there is a similar test coming to the people of this planet. That's why we need to learn. So a stone was placed on the mouth of the lion's den, just as a stone was placed on Christ's tomb. And it was sealed with a gun. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew about the death decree. He went into his house, his windows being open, in his chamber toward Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed, and he gave thanks before his God as he had always done. Daniel could have 
used that scripture where Jesus said, enter into your closet and shut the door. But he was not going to hide his relationship with God. He flung his windows open. Amen. He prayed toward Jerusalem. He got on his knees where he was in a physical posture of prayer, and he prayed out loud. Amen. He put the law of God ahead of the law of man. The law of God said, thou shalt not have other gods, and that even means the king of Persia, even if it means you're going to lose your job, even if it means you're going to lose your life. Did God honor Daniel, Daniel for his faithfulness? Sure enough. Well, you know the spies were watching, and pretty soon they ran to the king. And they said, king, you know you made that law, and the law does not change that if anybody prays to any god or man for 30 days except you, he's going to the lion. The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts presents... The great commandment is to love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. You notice that great commandment includes everybody. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. You remember a little bit of rehearsal that the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, had a wild feast. And in the party, he began to mock the God of heaven, and he used these holy vessels to praise the gods of silver and gold and wood and stone and clay. Medo-Persian government officials heard that. They were outraged that they would take this captive from Judah and that they would be replaced. They went before the king, and they sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Had private detectives following him around, trying to find something that he was doing wrong but they found he was faithful in every area of his life. Finally, they persuaded the king to make a law. And this, the idea was, you make this religious political law and it will weld the kingdom together. together. That's why Nebuchadnezzar made the golden statue to try and create solidarity, um, solidarity among all these different nations. Make a law that nobody should pray to anybody but you for the next 30 days and the king thought, well, yeah, well, that makes the kingdom stronger, and it appealed to his ego, so he signed it into law. And the Bible tells us the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. It says it four times. It cannot be changed. And they knew that. Now, this scripture really stirs me with emotion. It tells us in Daniel chapter 6, verse 15, or verse 10, I'm sorry. And as a result of that, this handwriting appeared on the wall, and it pronounced the judgment on Babylon. They didn't know what the handwriting meant, so they brought in Daniel. And Daniel then interpreted it. Meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsin. You are weighed in the balances and found wanting. And your kingdom is now divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Matter of fact, that very night, the Medes and the Persians were diverting the Euphrates River where it went under the walls of Babylon, and the kingdom of Babylon fell. All of the, co the government officials and the cabinet that had served Belshazzar were executed with one exception. That old patriarch and prophet named Daniel, he was spared because he had an excellent spirit in him. A matter of fact, he became one of the prime advisors for King Darius of the, the Median king. And Darius was so impressed with the wisdom and the commitment and the honesty of Daniel, he was thinking about putting Daniel in charge of the whole empire of Medo-Persian, prime minister. Well, when the other 